Yeah, exactly. Actually, I uh, I was it's a, like I was saying, you, you got like a sixth sense, man. It's like I'm sure about that. Uh, I will investigate that, but because <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a great timing today for me, and uh, it's my birthday, and I released my book this this week. Um, well, let's ask oh, you and Phil if you could get a link of that book in the private chat. Then we can post yeah. that for all those people watching on the various stream sources. Uh, and uh, you can share it with the audience who might be interested. Can you forward the link I just posted? Yes, sir. I will pull it up first, and then I'm going to put it also in the live chat for everybody. So this right here, Finite Theory and Gravito Magnetism, Solutions for Anti-Gravity by Phil Bouchard. Wow. Look at that. And look at it. It looks so official, too. It's like a textbook. Good work, it's, Phil. Congratulations. Thanks. It's um it's the, the new and final edition. Everything is written in it, all my equation. The uh the derivation of the gravitomagnetic uh, perme permeability is there also. Uh it's free for the next three days. The Kindle edition is free. So just Download it right now. It works in your browser. Kindle works in your browser, and uh, it's free for the next three days. So um, I know, I know, I know. People don't like maths, mathematics a lot. Don't like to buy books on mathematics, but this one is free. And um, All right, you say it's free for the next three days. So everybody yeah. definitely use this link. And well, I'm gonna have to download that right now. The, the mathematics are not that complicated. It's mostly algebra and some calculus, but um, the physics behind were not easy to uh, figure out, but uh, I figured, I figured it, out, it all out in two years. Everything works. Um, everything is perfect, and uh, I've got two experiments um, that result. Well, I got three. I, I had I had, the, I had I had three experiments. Uh, one is the, the Michelson-Morley experiment aboard the International Space Station. I was nev never able to uh, to perform because I need I need like five hundred thousand dollars to uh, to perform it. Because uh, why the International Space Station? Because it goes very fast and it's at a low orbit. And uh, I was I'm predicting that you should see a shift in the direction of the ship of the of, of the, the the station. Um, you know, a small shift that we should be able to measure using uh, latest equipment on uh, like a wavelength meter. Uh, so we should be able to measure a shift uh, about that. And um, I got two more experiments as well. Um, I was confused uh, lately, but I uh, I got unconfused uh, in the last two months, and I now I've got two clear experiments. One is the I've got the equipment too. I just received the uh, the equipment. One is a uh, can you see that? It's uh, yeah, this way. It's a liquid metal vortex. So um, I it's like a liquid metal. Liquid metal vortex. I'm gonna I'm gonna use uh, magneto hydrodynamics to make the gallium. Well, it's the liquid metal is gonna be gallium. So I'm gonna use uh, magneto hydrodynamics to make the the gallium spin very fast at three hundred meters a second ideally but uh, i should be able to measure something before that 300 meters a second is uh it's quite fast it's like uh, 30,000 rpms but uh, and what's your diameter there in the internal uh cavity yeah it's um it's like uh 10 centimeters it's the the outer the outer radius is uh 11 centimeters and the inner one is six cent centimeters oh it's a big channel so you have a large amount of gallium mass rolling around in there yeah it's 1.5 kilogram of gallium i'm gonna put put in 
And um, you see, I've got the, so I've got this. I'm going to put the gallium. I'm going to put the car in a cover on top. And I'm going to put, I have also neodymium magnets. I, I received them today. They're very strong magne magnets. Uh, I'm going to put one on below and one on top to create a strong magnetic field. I'm going to put an electric current, like a maximum of 5 amps, 5 amps. Just one amp is quite dangerous, but um, ideally it should be five amps. Um, and uh, so with the electric current and the the strong magnetic field, the gallium should spin very fast, and I should be able to measure uh, a shift in uh, the gravitational uh, acceleration. I would expect so from the field of the gallium. That, that would definitely make sense in terms of your pre-alignment of the nuclear magnetic moment, the strong B-flux of your permanent neodymium magnets on top and bottom, and then, of course, your acceleration from MHD. My wonder exactly. is, like, how you're going to inject the current through the gallium mixture and across uh, yeah, your B-flux. Well, uh, good question. Well, that's why, uh, that's why here my uh, metal rings are in metal, because it's still metal, uh, so I can just... Plug it, plug a electric wire right here. There's gallium here, and another electric wire down below here. Now, what did, what material did you find that will not react in any kind of catalytic way with gallium? Because we know that stuff likes to eat its way through various metals, uh, especially aluminum. Wow, well, you're, you're smart. Uh, you, you, you asked the, the, the right question, Jeremiah. I uh, had to buy tungsten disulf fit the spray I'm going to put on top of the steel because the gallium reacts is corrosive with steel so I have to, to, to put some layers of uh, tungsten uh, spray because it, it, it's not going to react with tungsten but with yeah, steel that should be one of the few materials that is quite inert in the gallium liquid environment exactly so yeah you, you, while you he really has the right question, incredibly. That's, uh, I've looked at actually uh, five different systems involving the rotation of a high-mass liquid that has an odd nuclear spin integer value, like what you're trying to work with here. And I, I, I like the idea. If you can get your RPMs up and you can achieve 300 meters per second, I would expect you to be able to observe it even with the sensors in your cell phone. Yeah, so, so I'm hoping uh, that you do. Yeah, that's going to create the uh, gravitomagnetic field that I should be able to measure with my phone. Like I did two years ago with, uh, actually, there was a, a Dyson uh, engine I was using two years ago. So it was spinning. It was uh, smaller, but it was spinning very fast. Wasn't that a solid mass in that, in that version of yours? Uh, I'm sorry? Wasn't that a solid mass in that older version? Yeah, there the, the was a rotating engine, a Dyson engine. That's what it was. And what was um, your moving mass in that system that you were using to generate the gravitomagnetic field moment? Yeah, there the was the uh, the um, vacuum, the Dyson vacuum engine. That was Just spinning. the uh, rotor itself is what you were using, the materials of the rotor, and that was it? Yeah, just the material. There was... Uh, and I tested my cell phone to see if it was affected by the magnetic field and things like that. And apparently it's not. It's, I, you know, I, 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 uh, I brought the uh, gravimeter close to the, to the monitor and was not affected by the magnetic field of the monitor. So, uh, uh, so we, that's why I'm pretty sure it was uh, just me measuring gravity. Well, I'm 99% sure that uh, everything was fine, but I'm going to confirm it right now with my scaled-up experiment. Um, I'm going to use a, a mechanic balance. So, you know, I can't go wrong. So the, the balance is going to be mechanic. There cannot be any interference by magnetic field and things like that. So, um, right, assuming the balance, of course, you're going to design entirely out of non-magnetic 
non-ferro per, uh, peri or um, diamagnetic material. So obviously yeah. you want a plastic or polymer that's of the right substance. And then you want to set that thing up. So your detection mm -hmm. or measurement equipment is sufficiently far from the immediately operating near field range of the device. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, 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 the new dimium magnets are going to be strong, uh, pretty strong. So um, I need to get some special gloves. I think my hockey gloves are not going to be strong enough. They're too tough, but... Uh, Classic Canadian. How big are hockey these gloves? magnets? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of I do I have, have to ask, your liquid this metal, what sort of liquid metal are you planning on testing and using uh, this time around? You're saying oh, gallium? He said gallium. Or, but uh, also I would recommend maybe trying mercury or... Uh, if possible, when you after you do your initial tests, if I could send you some of my different monoatomic materials, that uh, these monoatomic uh, materials uh, from the Keshi, well, in the Keshi Foundation, their reactor units, they say when they spin these uh, um, monoatomic materials, these plasma materials at uh, uh, over 4,000 RPM and higher. Uh, I've seen videos that if real, it start, seems to start emitting a physical visible plasma field from uh, the monoatomic metal materials. Uh, why haven't I heard about uh, this? I would have just taken my monoatomic, stuck them on a rotor, made sure I achieved a high peak velocity at the edge and spun them at 30,000 RPMs burning. Why have you never that, told me about this? Yeah, so uh, I have mentioned it a couple times, but usually a few hours part. into the stream, so and we're just one hour in. So yeah, and I haven't tested it myself, but I've seen a lot of them like in the early uh, days of the Keshi Foundation um, Zoom streams of the reactor group that I part participated in, uh, especially in the Arizona reactor group uh them doing it and when they were getting to like five six seven thousand rpm that it was like this bluish purple uh field that was like emanating out and i think the video is still up of them taking the um like the em M detector like the electric detector or whatever and like it beeping wherever they'd go like um like so I guess it was like 10, 15 feet up in this warehouse up this ladder and it was still going off and stuff. It was pretty intense. Nice. Worth and, checking uh, out. And also the, 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 that's, uh, that's, the, that's my first experiment, but the second experiment is much simpler and uh, has much greater potential. Um, it's the... Elf wave generator. Elf is, stands for extremely low frequency waves. It's being used for therapy, like I was saying before. But um, I'm going even lower than the uh, what they use for therapy. I'm going to the uh, down to the um, three point twenty seven times ten to the minus eight hertz. Um, and I got I bought I bought a machine that is able to to generate that. I should get by mid June. It's it's able to generate actually nanohertz uh, electromagnetic waves with the, down to the nanohertz level. So why why nanohertz? Because that's the exact frequency of the gravitons on the surface of the Earth. So uh, if it's possible that gravitons are just photons, like the gravity photons theory, um, because there's no uh, the, the, there's no difference between the photon and the graviton other than the spin, and the spin too is just a, a mathematical uh, abstract created by by Minkowski, and it's not, it's not a physical thing. Uh, it's not an angular momentum, it's just a mathematical abstract. So, um, so, so, so if, it, if it's, if it works, if it, if it works, then it's going to be awesome. And uh, it doesn't require a lot of energy, like 0 0.001 watts. 
that's about it. And you should be able to measure something. So uh, it's all written in my book and uh, all the calculations are written, not the details of the, the technical details of my experiment, but all the mathematics, mathematics are there. I forgot to mention also the, uh, I'm also explaining the, the whole universe. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, I forgot to, to explain that I'm explaining the whole universe, the rotation curve of the galaxy, the galaxy, uh, the galaxies without dark dark matter, the expansion of the universe without dark energy, um, the light bending, perihelion precession. Um, yeah, pretty much everything. And even the, I'm explaining the size of the, of the universe, we, we, we're actually, uh, I figure, I figure we're, we, we, we are, uh, in a bubble universe and we, the, the great universe we see, it's kind of a, kind of a, uh, a, a multiverse, you know, a bubble multiverse. Um, so it's anyway, I'm not going to enter that, but it's out of a, it's out of topic, but, uh, I'm explaining everything. I'm even explaining the uh, flyby anomaly, um, the micro, micro gal, the, the experiment that is able to detect the earth going through, uh, either, uh, either wind, like if you want, because the earth, if you measure the, the gravity at the micro gal level, each six hours, at each 90 degrees rotation of the, the earth, then you'll measure a shift, a difference between what is predicted and what, what is measured. So there's clearly uh, ether wind and the International Space Station ha knows about that problem also because they, they had to adjust the uh, speed of the International Space Station uh, depending on the, the time of day uh, it is because the gravity shifts because of that. The, the gravitational right. acceleration. The atomic energy coming from the sun, the various energy density of the electromagnetic field fluxes, and of course what Gravity Probe B discovered, which is the most damning piece of information in, in terms of what we need to reconsider that's not in the mathematics, which is a frame dragging phenomena from the propagation of equal potential points in the gravitational emission from mass on the Earth. Yeah, the gravity probe B is uh, was used for uh, the geo the the Zik and the uh, lens steering measurement, but apparently they they had technical problems and the uh, DGEN on Apex said they had technical problems and they kind of uh, blurred the real results. The real results it, for the amount of money they paid, they, they didn't want to admit that they they had technical problems. But uh, uh, but anyways, it, it's that 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 part is, is kind of gray area in my mind. I, I didn't review the all the mathematics they they had on it, but um, but it, at the same time, how can you measure two two effects with one gyroscope? You know, for for me, it's. You know, there's a lot of vague things uh, on the gravity probe B I need to clarify, but... Um, well, I would um, agree with that completely, and it's not exactly been forthcoming with the information on their part for these exactly. questions to be answered. For example, I wanted to see, and I was looking very closely when the first Voyager probe exited what they call our you know, our solar plane, or this area, this ring sort of... Around it's, it's called the heliosphere. Thank you. That's exactly right. Yes, and when it exited, I wanted to look at one specific thing. So I had this crazy idea in my head that maybe the speed of light out there wasn't quite the same as the speed of light closer to the sun, and by how much. I mean, obviously, we know it's displaced to some extent. That was the experiment that everybody patted Einstein on the back for and cracked wine bottles open for, right? Oh, light bends around the sun during an eclipse. Oh, my goodness, he's right. The theory does predict that gravitation should bend the path of light. No explanation as to why, of course, but that's okay because at least now this idea exists at that time. Well, now we've got these other weird phenomena where the light being bent doesn't exactly follow the exact straight line heading out from the center of the gravitational mass, but tends to curve based on its rotation. And so we have this other weird frame dragging effect, also known as torsion field mechanics, 
an entire category of study spanning electrodynamics and mechanical phenomena. So I think that's what you're initially messing with too when you're talking about gravito magnetism, really diving into that category of torsion field mechanics where instead of a compression or an expansion in space time, you have a twist in space time, which has yeah. an entirely different set of rules binding it. And it also allows the accumulation of localized stress energy momentum. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, well, great explanation. <laughs> um, Localized stress energy momentum, aka inertial mass. Oh, okay. thanks for the clarifications. <laughs> Jer Jeremiah, is that correct? Yeah, that's actually the reason for why you're getting inertial mass in the first place with physical matter. Totally, totally freaking agree. Um, I've said it some other ways, but yeah, it's the same thing. Well, in terms of what you're working on with Alzapon, this effect can be directly correlated in the heaviest particles of mass within the nuclei, our neutrons and protons, right? That can be directly correlated with spin alignment and reaction to externally imposed gravitational field. 100%. Everything relates to, to the harmonics and the alignments and, and getting your magnetic get moment for each constituent. Oh, oh, and get this. This is really funny. After uh, Sir Fadi kicks me out of the Cortana conference, and thank you so much for doing that, Jack. Um, I was... Uh, all the people at the conference, all the at least the top brains, uh, Cleon and this other guy, uh, uh, David Chester, were suddenly very interested in all my work. And uh, I got on the phone with David for like an hour and I was explaining to him the Alzafon theory and experiment. And I got the same feedback from him that I've gotten from many people in the past that I'm not so sure about Alzafon's theory, but the experiment has, you know, sounds very intriguing. But I have a theory about why the experiment will work. And that's what David went on about. Some obscure force that was detected um, related to an electron. And it's just at the, um, it's barely detectable because it doesn't go past the electrons field much. Um, and he, he theorized that that would probably be uh, what we are expanding um, with uh, EPR and dynamic nuclear orientation. But um yeah, I had that same result with uh, with myself, with Michael Perone, um, and now it's with uh, David Chester. And there was one other, uh, also um, Todd Desiato. He has his own theory as to why the experiment will work. Everyone has their own theory about why it will work. But we're, yeah, the we're, one we're... difficult part is learning how to grab on to that nuclear magnetic moment and actually spin it up. First, you've got to create the spin. And then you've got to create the precession. And both of those things, yeah, although they're being said here simply, are some of the most difficult matters of physics because we're talking about incredibly, incredibly small particles which require tremendously large fields and a total control over the refractive index. You can't directly access them. You have to modify the conditions under which they behave. And that's the only way to get them to spin. So I was thinking, uh, I, I got this fancy new uh, signal generator. And instead of just humming it at nine and a half gigahertz, it has an FM overlay. So I can like change the frequency from its Larmor frequency just up a couple kilohertz and back again, sort of like to pump the electrons into a higher energy state um, as part of each pulse. So it would start at nine and a half gigahertz. And then uh, a millisecond later, it's, you know, pumping up to nine and a half gigahertz plus one or two kilohertz higher just to slowly pick up the electrons a little bit more and maybe latch onto it a little bit better if you're, like, speeding it up, sort of, like... I figure a ramp is going to work pretty darn good for that, just in general, if you're going...